I'm Heather Hiscox, and this is The National. It's something we all say does not happen in small communities. Well, we found out today it does. A gunman opens fire at a church in rural Texas, leaving multiple dead, including children. And... I would say that it... that there are lots of red flags. From the Prime Minister's chief fundraiser... I'm the finance guy. ...to the Russian money connections and those closest to the U.S. president. If they hadn't been for Wilbur Ross, Donald Trump would not be in the White House. An incredible leak of documents that reveal the secret money trails of the global elite. We have the story covered from several angles. Americans are reeling once again after a new mass act of horror, barely a month after the deadliest shooting in modern U.S. history. This time, at least 26 people killed in Texas shot in a church during a service, several of the dead children. Around 20 other people were wounded in the rampage, many of them seriously. Lindsay Duncombe has the latest tonight from Washington. People who live in this tiny Texas town are gathering in their community center tonight, anxious for updates on the injured, grieving the dead. We all in here know what happened today. And it's something we all say does not happen in small communities. Police say the gunman was young, white, and dressed all in black. He had an assault-style rifle and went into the church shooting. When he left, a neighbor approached the gunman with his rifle. There was a car chase. The gunman was found dead in his car. It's unclear if he killed himself or was wounded in a shootout. Police aren't identifying him and told reporters... If you came here wanting to know the motive behind this shooting, you're going to leave here disappointed. Thanks to the Lord, I got again. First Baptist Church posts its services online. This was last week, eerie to watch now. You get a sense of how small the congregation is, how young. It's unclear if what happened this morning was recorded. People called the church no the heart God of this God. small town. Its Facebook no page featuring pictures from a recent fall fair. I've been going to this church since I was knee high to a duck. I changed my mind to go to church today. And so did my daughter. Otherwise, we'd be there. But, and there's another lady that was just up there. She left like 10 minutes before it happened to go clean the kitchen. President Donald Trump spoke about the shooting from Japan. Through the tears and through the sadness, we stand strong, oh so strong. What happens next is predictable. Calls for gun control countered by calls for people to get more guns for safety. Thoughts, prayers, funerals. For America, a pattern of grief. For people who live here, unimaginable pain. <laughs> Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. Now to our other big story tonight. Millions of dollars hidden offshore. Dubious tax dodges, in some cases, possibly illegal evasions. And it reaches into the highest levels of power here in Canada and around the world. It all comes from the Paradise Papers, a massive leak of secret documents, mostly from a Bermuda-based blue-chip firm called Appleby. Appleby has some of the biggest corporate clients in the world. The leaks include emails, spreadsheets, and corporate records. CBC News has been working with the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, the ICIJ, since early this year, along with major media outlets from around the world, including the Toronto Toronto Star and Radio Canada. The Canadian part of the story has connections to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and the Liberal Party of Canada. It focuses on Montreal's Bronfman family, one of the wealthiest in the country. The Fifth Estate's Gillian Finley begins our coverage. Stephen Bronfman became the Liberal Party's revenue chair in 2013. Yeah, I'm the finance guy. A longtime friend of Justin Trudeau, for years he worked for and then headed the Bronfman family's investment firm, Claridge. And it's Claridge that in 1991 set up the offshore trust in question in the Cayman Islands. It was registered in the name of Stephen's godfather, Leo Colbert. Colbert preceded Bronfman as head of Claridge, also as the chief bagman for the Liberals. Mr. Colbert. He was named to the Senate and honored with the Order of Canada. 
But today, details about the trust that was set up in the former senator's name raise serious questions. I would say that, it, that there are lots of red flags, and I would expect tax authorities specifically uh, to be very interested in following up. According to the Paradise Papers, the Colbert Trust was funded largely by Bronfman money, grew to be worth more than $60 million U.S. Under Cayman law, there would be no tax on the earnings, and to keep Canadian authorities at bay, there were rules that had to be followed, which the leaked documents suggest were not. Well, I think people have a right to be angry about this. And that Tax experts we consulted point to a number of apparent violations, transactions that appear to be shams. Obviously, if they are hiding payments that could give rise to tax consequences in Canada. Payments that seem to have been disguised. That's a smoking gun right there. Actually, it's very bold to write it down. It looks as if it was intended to mislead. It looks as if it was intended to conceal and to misrepresent the nature of the payment. Many times, decisions about the trust appear to have originated with people associated with Claridge Investments, which raises perhaps the most serious question. Did it even qualify as an offshore trust? According to the Canada Revenue Agency, decisions about offshore trusts really do have to be made offshore by trustees and not by the people who stand to benefit. And yet, time and again, the Paradise Papers show decisions about the Colbert Trust being made in Montreal. If at the end of the day, the major decision are taken here, or taking place here, the mine management is in Canada, so the trust is a Canadian trust. And if it was a Canadian trust, that means that Revenue Canada could decide to hold those who made contributions to the trust liable for taxes, possibly going back decades. Julian Finley, CBC News, Toronto. The trust was never set up to avoid taxes, and there is no suggestion of false invoices or disguised payments. Still, the Revenue Minister's office says the CRA is reviewing links to Canadian entities and will take appropriate action in regards to the Paradise Papers. The opposition was also quick to react tonight. Justin Trudeau's priority was really tax fairness. It's very curious that he's done nothing to go after the mega millionaires who stuff their money in foreign tax havens in order to avoid Canadian tax. It's really problematic because the same governments are making it easier for their friends to, uh, to place their money in offshore accounts. And then after that, they say, we can't do anything, it's legal. It's obvious to Canadians that people, well, lots of people and, and the well-off are not paying their, their fair share. Our Rosemary Barton has been watching all of this from Ottawa. Rosie, what are the implications for the Trudeau government here? There's a couple of potential problems, but really the timing couldn't be worse for the government. You'll remember that these revelations come just a few weeks after the government moved to close so-called loopholes for Canadian small business owners. They said that they were doing this in the interest of tax fairness, but there was a huge outcry and backlash from Canadians, and so they've had to back way down on some of those tax reforms. But this story will uh, remind those people and other Canadians that there is already an issue of tax fairness in our tax system. And and that is that wealthy people can put large amounts of money on offshore accounts. Uh, now, of course, they can do this legally, but it still raises the question about tax fairness. Government after government uh, has not gone nearly far enough to try and recoup some of that money. Although, as recently as last week, the revenue minister did say that this government has spent about a billion dollars over two years to fight tax evasion. But she means tax evasion overall, Heather. What about specifically, though, the way the Liberals, this government, positions itself on taxes? Again, they have got elected on the issue of being middle class champions of the middle class. They've got this. They had the issue with Bill Morneau, who took advantage of an ethical loophole to control his own assets. Now he's put them in a blind trust. And obviously, Bronfman and, and Colbert are not elected officials. There is not the same level of accountability, but they are close to the party, have been for years. Bronfman raises money for the party, is a friend of Trudeau's. So in this instance, it is a question of optics for the Liberal Party and for the government, even if there is no clear wrongdoing. Rosemary, thank you very much. You're welcome. The more than 13 million records in this leak also revealed secrets in Washington, including those of a top member of Donald Trump's cabinet. Wilbur Ross is Commerce Secretary, but his deep ties to Trump and, as these documents suggest, his financial ties to Russia 
are what's causing a stir tonight. The New York Times and the BBC looked into this part of the story as part of the global collaboration. Keith Bogue has the details. Wilbur mentioned a couple of words, reciprocal trade. One thing that separates Wilbur Ross from the other billionaires at Donald Trump's cabinet table is how far back in the president's history he goes and how important he was to making Trump what he is today. If it hadn't been for Wilbur Ross, Donald Trump would not be in the White House. David K. Johnson has chronicled the ups and downs of Trump's business career for three decades, including his failure in Atlantic City, New Jersey, with the money-losing Taj Mahal Casino that almost sank Trump. Ross, trained as a bankruptcy advisor, engineered a deal for Trump that kept him afloat in part by establishing that the Trump name had its own value as a brand. Wilbur Ross was a key negotiator in Donald Trump not having to go through bankruptcy and not being swept into the dustbin of history. I, Wilbur Lewis Ross, you... This year, Ross became the United States Secretary of Commerce. He divested most of his business assets, but kept a stake in a shipping company called Navigator, where he was once chairman. One of Navigator's biggest customers is Russia's largest gas and petrochemical company, Sibor. Among Sibor's owners are Kirill Shimalov, President Vladimir Putin's son-in-law, and Gennady Chemchenko, an oligarch who has direct links to Putin and who's been under sanction by the U.S. government. As Commerce Secretary, Ross has influence over trade and sanctions that could affect Sibor's owners. If I were in the business of consulting, which I am not, I would advise any client who came to me to stay well away from Sibor or anybody else uh, who has been sanctioned. Daniel Freed was coordinator for sanctions policy during the Obama administration. If you know anything about the Russians, it's that under the current system, it's easy to get dirty. Don't go there, man. Don't go there. Ross's stake in the Navigator shipping company is opaque. It can be traced through different companies, some of which are in the Cayman Islands, which require a little disclosure of corporate ownership. Often, companies are registered there to avoid taxes. During his confirmation hearing in the Senate, Ross faced no questions about Navigator or its links to Russia and Vladimir Putin. He was asked many questions about his former role as vice president of the Bank of Cyprus, long known as the Bank of Russian Oligarchs. Keep Oak, CBC News, Washington. A spokesman for Wilbur Ross said today the Commerce Secretary has never met Putin's son-in-law or the Russian energy company's other owners. He adds Ross recuses himself from matters that relate to international shipping and is generally supportive of the administration's sanctions against Russian entities. While it may come as no surprise to see many of the world's top politicians named in the Paradise Papers, this next one might take you aback. The Queen. Turns out she, too, has millions of pounds invested in a Cayman Islands fund that has never been disclosed. The palace says the Queen knew nothing about this until now. Nala Ayed has that part of the story. At just over a dollar per British person per year, the Queen, one of her officials said recently, is excellent value for money. But with the more than $71 million annual public paycheck, the Queen also receives a private income. Some of it comes from a private estate established for the monarch 700 years ago, called the Duchy of Lancaster. Through it, the Queen owns swaths of lucrative real estate, like the storied Savoy Hotel and vast tracts of land all over the UK. In addition to properties like Somerset House, the Duchy of Lancaster also invests money to generate income for the Queen. And according to leaked documents, that also includes investments offshore. The Queen's private estate, the Duchy of Lancaster, turned up in the Paradise Papers with stakes in two funds, based then in the Cayman Islands and Bermuda, worth about $18 million. Investing British pounds offshore isn't illegal. But given the murkiness of that world, it raises questions of transparency for the Queen and in what dubious places her money can end up. It's so obvious that if you're looking after the money of the monarchy, you've got to be actually cleaner than clean and you must never go near the dirty world of money laundering, tax avoidance, tax evasion. 
uncomfortable in this case because it turns out the Queen, through the duchy, acquired an indirect stake in Bright House, a chain of rent-to-own appliance stores repeatedly accused of taking advantage of some of Britain's poorest citizens. Though it stands at just a few thousand pounds now, the initial investment is still undisclosed. The connection to Bright House was discovered here, in a restricted access room at the Guardian newspaper, where investigative reporters have worked quietly for months, chasing up promising leads in the Paradise Papers. Bright House was a name that I was quite familiar with because there have been quite a lot of, um, sort of stories in the past about um, kind of how they offer high-cost credit to vulnerable families, and um, I've covered some of those stories. The duchy did not respond to CBC's questions, but it told The Guardian it was not aware the Queen had a stake in Bright House until questions came from the ICIJ, that it did so unwittingly, as it was not party to the fund's ongoing investment decisions. The money has kind of ended up there, rather than being carefully put there. But I think that people would be a bit shocked that they don't know where the money is trickling down to. As part of her personal fortune, the Queen has a whole other separate and likely much bigger investment portfolio, and few details are made public on that. Nala Ayed, CBC News, London. We have more on the Paradise Papers just ahead. Gillian Finley will be back with a deeper look at the Canadian connection. That's a smoking gun right there. Straight ahead on The National. You can't just sit back and play with your own little world. There are other worlds out there, lots of them. And you can't just ignore them or brush them aside. You see, the world you know is really made up of lots of other worlds, and all of them have their own problems, which, in fact, become your problems. And worlds aren't made up simply of problems. Good things happen, exciting things and they all affect you. The thing is to understand what's happening. And to understand, you have to have a complete and comprehensive view of matters. And where to get this information? It's easy. The National News, nightly, on CBC Television. So welcome other worlds into your life. It's almost fun. The National News. Five nights a week, in the national newsroom of CBC Television, the stories come in from all parts of the world to be interpreted and prepared for use on The National. The facts are checked and the backgrounds gathered. On-the-spot reports are collected. Then the films and the tapes are evaluated and edited, readied for the air. CBC's correspondents in all corners of the world report and interpret the news. Wherever things are happening, you'll get the complete information right here on CBC Television. I'm Warren Davis. Those are just some of the things that go into the national. Join me. From here, each day at 1 o'clock, Canada is given the exact time. 60 Canadian radio stations relay the signal to the nation. The CBC brings you the Dominion Observatory official time signal. The beginning of the long dash, which follows 10 seconds of silence, will indicate exactly 1 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. One o'clock, Eastern Daylight Time.
Our top story, and the story making headlines around the world, a massive leak of secret documents on offshore tax havens reveals that Prime Minister Trudeau's chief fundraiser for the Liberal Party, Stephen Bronfman, is tied to a multi-million dollar trust in the Cayman Islands. The revelation comes after months of work by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists and here in Canada by the CBC, Radio-Canada and the Toronto Star. The Fifth Estate's Gillian Finley brought us this story at the top of our newscast. She joins me again to take us deeper inside the investigation. Gillian, let's begin with Stephen Bronfman himself. He is named, he is mentioned by name in these Paradise Papers. Who is he? Well, he is probably the Bronfman that most Canadians have never heard of, Heather. He's always kept a very low profile as a businessman, a philanthropist, an environmentalist. But in 2013, he became a powerful player in Justin Trudeau's Liberal Party. It was a summer caucus retreat in PEI, and for the first time in a long time, Liberals were upbeat. A new charismatic leader a new hope for power. Well, across the country, people have told me that we need better. And for the first time in a long time, people are open and hopeful about the Liberal Party of Canada. Among those assembled was a man not much used to the campaigning part of politics, but a man the party would now rely on to raise the money it takes for campaigns to succeed. You're going to get some muscles? Uh, <laughs> Stephen Bronfman had just been named to the party's national board with his good friend Justin by his side. He's an old friend. Uh, PEI marked his coming out as revenue chair. Oh, the success will be, uh, will, will be whether or not we win the next election, which we will, and so that's, and that's how we gauge it. Money. Money's a big part. And money is what Bronfman brought in. $15 million in the year that followed, more than the party had seen in any year in a decade. Armed with that, Team Trudeau forged ahead. Working hard on it, need your support. Sweeping to victory, and the promise of defending middle-income Canadians, fair taxes for all. It's a promise Prime Minister Trudeau never fails to repeat. We got elected on a promise to make sure uh, that people were paying their fair shares of taxes. Tax avoidance, tax evasion is something that we take very seriously. The system we have right now encourages the wealthy to pay less tax. That's not fair, and we're going to fix it. So how to explain today's revelations in the Paradise Papers? A company headed by Justin Trudeau's hand-picked chief fundraiser, heavily involved in an offshore trust that may have cost Canadians millions in unpaid taxes. It's a 20-year trail of confidential memos and private records from two prominent Liberal families, exposing what tax experts say appear to be sham transactions, disguised payments, tax loopholes exploited at every turn. When you see a pattern of intentional recharacterizations or mischaracterizations, I would say that there are lots of red flags, and I would expect tax authorities specifically to be very interested in following up. The story begins in Montreal with the Bronfman family itself. Ensconced in the luxury of Westmount, generations have overseen a fortune built on distillery. Today, Stephen Bronfman runs a big part of the family empire, heading the investment company called Claridge. It is Claridge that's revealed in the Paradise Leak as helping to set up an offshore trust in 1991 in the Cayman Islands. The trust was in the name of Colbert, Leo Colbert. He's Stephen Bronfman's godfather, used to run Claridge himself, and the two of them worked side by side for years. Colbert was as close to the Bronfmans as anyone could be, a surrogate son who jokingly called himself the family's consigliari and who used his connections to raise millions for the Liberal Party of Canada. Private fundraisers at his own Westmount home, parties attended by Bronfmans and Prime Ministers alike. Colbert was very close to Pierre Trudeau, too. Yes, that's young Justin with them there. It was Trudeau Sr. who rewarded Colbert by appointing him to the Senate. 
And it was while Leo Kolber was sitting as a senator and running Claridge that he established his offshore trust. The trust may have been called Kolber, but according to the Paradise Papers, much of the money invested came from the Bronfmans. An initial $9.6 million loan from Stephen Bronfman's father, Charles. Five million a few years later from Stephen himself, an interest-free loan that was repaid within months. Bronfman Family Trusts in the U.S. would contribute even more loans over the years, as would a Canadian numbered company linked to Claridge. Together, they would grow the value of the trust to more than $60 million U.S., all of it in a jurisdiction that charges no tax. So who was going to benefit from all that money? Senator Colbert's two children, Jonathan and Lynn, were named beneficiaries, meaning they were authorized to get disbursements from the trust. The documents show they made liberal use of that, especially Jonathan. Payments to him totaled $16 million over the years, some of them tagged simply for lifestyle expenses. But the trust had another purpose, too. The Bronfman Empire was expanding into Israel. In 1991, after working for Claridge in Montreal, Jonathan moved to Israel to head up the family's efforts there. According to one document, for every dollar the Bronfmans invested in Israel, Jonathan's reward was a 15% share paid through the trust. This is how and why the trust was set up. So you have described quite the elaborate structure there, Jillian, and I guess the first question I would have about offshore trusts is, is it legal? Well, it was at the time, Heather, uh, certainly legal in the Cayman Islands where there would be no tax to pay, and it would be out of the reach of tax laws here too, as long as everyone involved followed the rules. And as far as the Canada Revenue Agency was concerned, the fundamental rule was this. The trust really did have to be offshore, meaning that decisions about the money in the trust had to be made offshore by trustees. So were the rules followed? Well, lawyers for the trust insist to us that they were. What they call the management and control of the trust was always in the Cayman Islands, they say. But time and again, the Paradise Papers reveal decisions being made in Canada by people associated with that Bronfman company, Claridge. There are numerous references in the papers to meetings in Montreal, requests for approval back in Canada. When investment money moved into or out of the trust, it was often authorized by a Montreal investment advisor named Don Chazen. Chazen kept a second set of books for Jonathan Colbert in Montreal, we're told, and made the decisions. If at the end of the day, the major decision are taken here, or taking place here, the mine management is in Canada, so the trust is a Canadian trust. Marwo Rizki teaches tax law at the University of Sherbrooke. She's one of half a dozen tax experts our team turned to to understand the materials we so received. This is Those references to Montreal, she says, could be problematic. Because if you see that the money comes from Montreal the, or from Canada, decisions are taking place in Canada. There's like too many things relating to Canada that will probably say, oh, hold on, is it a Canadian trust? And if it was a Canadian trust, the CRA would want to know. The Montreal advisors seemed concerned about that, discussed reducing links to Canada, or at least the appearance of links. Take this memo. It's about an $81,000 fee to Don Chazen, that Montreal accountant. It quotes tax advisors for the Bronfmans and the Colbert family, suggesting the trust reallocate the fee by calling it a loan repayment instead to someone else. The result would be one less formal link to entities outside the Caymans. That looks very suspicious. Grayson McCooch of the University of Florida is another of the experts we consulted. That looks deceptive on its face. It looks as if it was intended to mislead. It looks as if it was intended to conceal and to misrepresent the nature of the payment. So in fact, and that wasn't the only thing McCooch found suspicious. Another involved those payments or disbursements to Leo Kolber's children, specifically his daughter Lynn, who lived in the United States. 
It became clear that even though Lynn had received money from the trust, she hadn't paid U.S. tax on it. So the advisors came up with a fix. She'd pay the back taxes, but going forward, they would remove her as a beneficiary, pay disbursements to Jonathan in Israel, and leave it to Jonathan to take care of Lynn by giving her gifts instead. Gifts between family members are not taxable in the United States. I mean, th these are coming from... But were the payments really gifts, or, as Makuch wonders, simply disbursements in disguise? Is there any other way, potential way, to look at this and not conclude that this was deception? There's always the possibility of an innocent explanation. People have fertile minds. These are creative yeah. lawyers. Um, who knows what they might come up with, but the obvious explanation is that this was done to disguise or conceal or mislead. The answers we got from Jonathan Kolber's lawyers about the gifts were confusing. In a first letter to the CBC, they said Jonathan did make gifts to his sister, but argued it wasn't tax evasion. Three days later, we got a second letter in which they insisted Jonathan had made no gifts. But that wasn't the end of Jonathan's involvement. At another point, the issue was interest the trust was supposed to be paying on one of those U.S. loans from the Bronfman family. A series of faxes and emails marked confidential make it clear that Jonathan doesn't want to pay. And so there's another fix. Claridge advisors tell him they have to charge the interest, but they'll find a way to, quote, make him whole, perhaps by getting him to invoice Claridge for services rendered, equal to the interest paid. It's very convenient to have services rendered for the exact amount of interest paying in the United States. Mm. Very convenient. In their letter, Jonathan Kolber's lawyers were adamant. No invoices were sent and nothing was paid. But a former Claridge executive told us Jonathan did start charging for his services. Indeed, in the margin of that email, someone has written, done. Maybe this just re when we showed all that to Marwa Rizki, she was shocked. Well, that's a smoking gun right there. I mean, it's actually it's very bold to write it down. If you have a trust, with it no surprised Grace and McCooch too. If it's done solely to disguise uh, or to or to reverse the purported interest payments, then again, it could look to an observer, particularly a revenue service, it could look like an evidence of fraudulent intent. But what were the chances a revenue service was ever going to look, Heather? Don't forget, all of this was happening in secrecy. Yeah, in secret. And we know the Cayman Islands had a long reputation of protecting the identities of people who invested there. A very long reputation. As a matter of fact, for years, it was an actual crime in the Caymans for anyone to divulge any information about a client or an account, even to other tax authorities. By the late 90s in Canada, that kind of secrecy was starting to create friction. The battle was on to curtail offshore trusts and tax those who used them. But it would be a 13-year battle, uh, Heather, and we will see the Bronfmans and their advisors were going to figure prominently. So let's just pause that thought for a moment. We'll take a short break, Jillian, and pick up that part of the story after this. This is the National News Bulletin, a summary of the day's news. Even bad news sounded good in those exciting, terrible days when radio news came of age, especially when read by our own voice of doom, Lorne Green, and Haas was a cold. ...naval battle in the South Pacific. Madam, will you please put away that knitting? You're going to have to applaud, you know. Now, let's all relax. Everybody, shall we? Nobody be nervous. And to balance the glum news from overseas, CBC Radio offered happy-go-lucky fare. Who's there? It's the Happy Days! Well, come on in! <laughs> it all began in 1901. The discoverer of wireless, Marconi, received his first transatlantic radio message from Signal Hill in Newfoundland. Hi! And CBC Radio has been seeing to it that Canada gets the message ever since. In an array of programs from music talk shows like this, ranging through schools and youth, 
agriculture, religion, serious music, and variety. A busy place, the CBC, and a big country to serve. How do you suppose all these programs get to all the people spread all over the map? Well, if you think of the network as a superhighway, then you can picture national program clearance as the traffic cop who keeps things flowing smoothly. National program clearance arranges distribution of our radio and TV programs by landlines and by coast-to-coast -coast microwave network. Just to complicate matters, there are several problems arising out of the different time zones into which the country is divided, not to mention line availability. Ah, yes, line availability. I said not to mention that. Oh, sorry. Our CBC color presentation. <laughs> Let's follow an average broadcasting day from the beginning. It's very simple. There's the business of booking studios, getting the slides to Telecine, last minute news inserts, coffee to be ordered, public affairs specials, graphics to be ordered and approved, fair screen projection to be set up, stage hands to be scheduled, coffee to be brought, Beats to be lined up, pianos to tune, light bulbs to be replaced, monitors to be serviced, press releases to be issued, coffee to be tasted, props to be picked up, cameras to be fired, shot lists to be typed, careers to be scheduled, contracts to be drawn up, cold coffee to be dumped, memos to be filed. Hold it, hold it. Cut. <laughs> cut. The only way this will cut is go back to the beginning. The system we have right now encourages the wealthy to pay less tax. That's not fair, and we're going to fix it. Prime Minister Trudeau on a promise he often repeats, but one which may not square with revelations today that a company headed by Trudeau's chief political fundraiser was involved in an offshore trust that may have cost Canadians millions in unpaid taxes. Picking up the story, Gillian Finley of the Fifth Estate. We all pay taxes, Heather, or at least we're supposed to. But if you're part of Canada's 0.1%, like the Bronfman's, you can probably afford a lot of help to help you exploit a tax system to your advantage. Lawyers, accountants, even government lobbyists. In 1996, there was a revelation that made all of that pretty clear. It was, at the time, headline news. Good evening. Revenue Canada took a hit today for a tax ruling that helped the rich in a big way. How big? More than $2 billion. It was a secret ruling made five years earlier that no one would have known about if not for a nosy Auditor General. We don't have a uh, totally satisfactory explanation. An explanation for why Revenue Canada allowed what at the time was an unnamed family to move $2 billion out of Canada to a U.S. trust, tax-free. The media soon identified the family as the Charles Bronfman's, Stephen Bronfman's father. The Auditor General identified a process that didn't smell right. Denny Desotel has never confirmed the name of the family, and he didn't to us. But he says what he discovered bothers him to this day. Officials at Revenue Canada initially refused to endorse the tax-free deal, he says, and were overturned after the family threatened to go over their heads. There was enough pressure on Revenue Canada, I guess, to either pressure or, you know, arguments, you know, uh, put to them that, that in the end they uh, made them sign off. Uh, I mean, what did this say to you, the fact that uh, this wealthy family and, and all the people representing it had that kind of access? Uh, well, uh, it, it's, a, it's a red flag. A red flag, perhaps, but the Bronfmans, Charles and his children, got what they wanted, and Canada was out an estimated $700 million in lost tax. That got people's attention, and soon the debate turned to what to do about tax avoidance, especially offshore. A matter that has been studied to death. For years, the debate dragged on, but by 2007, it seemed a consensus had finally emerged. The House of Commons was about to pass a bill cracking down on offshore trusts, taxing Canadians who contribute on their earnings. 
You know, Mr. Speaker, you have to wonder why it's taking so long to close tax loopholes, to shut down tax havens, to deal with tax evaders, and to crack down on tax avoidance. For the NDP's Judy Wasilisha Lease, who'd spent a decade pushing for tax reform, it was a hallelujah moment. For me, it was an amazing period of time in, in life in Parliament because it was actually a time when all parties came together on one issue, and that was to find a way to stop the spread and growth of these tax havens and actually to, to put restrictions on them so we could see that money taxed in Canada. Ah, it was, it was in, it, quite incredible. It was real hope. But hope was about to run up against the Bronfmans and the rest of Canada's 0.1%. For the bill to become law, it now had to get through Parliament's upper chamber. And so it was to the Senate that the family's longtime law firm turned next, joining the campaign to have the bill scrapped. No amount of tinkering can fix these rules because they are conceptually flawed. The lawyers argued what was being proposed was too complicated, too unfair to those who invest offshore, not to mention those who help them. The common man thinks that tax advisors, tax lawyers and tax accountants spend their days looking for loopholes. Nothing could be further from the truth. So they may not have been looking for loopholes, Heather, but it was a tax loophole that those lawyers found. So I would imagine by that point, the Bronfmans and the Colbers had a lot of questions, had a lot of information about the proposed tax changes in Canada. Did you see any evidence of that in the Paradise Papers? Yes, we did. We also saw worries about what their advisors called tax difficulties. And it wasn't just Canada that had the concern, but the U.S. and Israel too. Tax reform was in the air everywhere. In Ottawa, lawyers were working hard to kill that bill in the Senate. But there was no guarantee they'd succeed. And so at that point, it seems, the advisors to the Colbert Trust went looking for Plan B. Two weeks after the bill got second reading in the Senate, down in the Caymans, another trust was set up. This one they called Lacombe. $23 million in assets that had been in the Colbert Trust were then transferred to Lacombe. The Paradise Papers confirmed that much of the original money in Colbert came from Canadians. Could they now claim that technically the money they transferred to Lacombe originated in the Caymans and not in Canada. Presumably the view was that um, by transferring it from Trust 1 to Trust 2, formally they would be outside the new rules for this new trust. Formally, Jeff Loomer teaches outside. tax law at Dalhousie University. Presumably that's the position, even though, you know, obviously we can stand back and look at it from a... Yeah. But has the substance really changed? No, but that's how this game works. And it's a game that, in the end, they didn't even have to play. The Colbers had their new trust. But back in Ottawa, that bill that the Bronfman law firm had been working to defeat got stalled in the Senate, dying when an election was called in 2008. Some documents that have come into our For Judy Wasilisha Lease, it was hard not to be cynical. What we're really dealing with is uh, almost like a, a legalized, um, legalized tax evasion. In other words, a system that is so embedded and so entrenched that every step of the way, uh, the vested interests uh, are connected to these, the, these wealthy families and corporations rule the day. So the bill died in 2008. Was that the end of Canada's efforts to legislate offshore trusts? No, but it would take another five years before a version of that bill finally be did become law, and then it was made retroactive to 2007. By then, a number of countries were cracking down on offshore trusts, including Israel. And for those associated with the Colber and the Lacombe Trusts, that was going to matter big time. In 2014, Israel passed its own law, taxing Israelis who were beneficiaries of offshore trusts. Jonathan Kolber was the beneficiary of the Kolber and Lacombe Trusts. For 15 years, he'd headed the Bronfman family business in Israel and was an Israeli citizen. 
at this point, according to the Paradise Papers. The decision was made to dissolve the trust in the Caymans, move the assets to Israel, and as per the new law, have Jonathan negotiate a settlement with Israeli tax authorities. But what about the Canadian tax authorities? Did anyone tell them about the trusts? In their letter responding to our questions, lawyers for Jonathan Kolber said it was their understanding the Israeli application was not sent to anyone in Canada. There was no need. Neither the Kolber nor the Lacombe Trust was ever liable to Canadian taxation, according to their interpretation. But shouldn't that have been up to the CRA to decide? Under Canada's new tax law, contributions to offshore trusts could be liable for tax if they originated in Canada. So the question is, did they? There is a document in the Paradise Leak that seems to confirm they did. It's a draft of Jonathan's settlement with Israel in 2015. Buried in it, one line in particular. The source of the trust assets, he says, was his father, who is a resident of Canada. So it seems to me he's saying there, yeah, the money came from yep. Canada originally. The contributions were Canadian. Yep. And if, if that's true, uh, and we've no reason to doubt that it's true, and if that's true, then um, I think the CRA would be interested to see that statement. So, Julian, as we heard, you asked Kolber's lawyers if anyone had told the CRA about those Canadian contributions, and their answer was no? That's what they said, Heather, and there's a lot that they didn't say as well. For instance, why Senator Kolber was cited as the source of the funds in 2015 when the Paradise Papers show so many of the original loans coming from the Bronfmans. The lawyers insist their clients have always acted properly, ethically, and in full compliance with the law. Any assertion to the contrary, they say, specifically any suggestion of false documentation, disguised conduct, fraud, or tax evasion, is false. Well, what about all those experts you consulted? Did they come to any conclusion? No, what they all say, it, which is true, at the end of the day, is going to be for the CRA to sort that out. What they think the central issue could be, though, is that fundamental question we talked about earlier. Was the trust really offshore? Because if it wasn't, if it wasn't, in effect, a Canadian trust being managed in Montreal, then earnings were, at the very least, reportable to the CRA, which would then have to come to its own conclusions about what tax, of any, might be owed. You started this story, Gillian, telling us about Stephen Bronfman. As you've reported, he loaned money to the Colbert Trust. He heads the company that helped set it up. He's also the Liberal Party's revenue chair. Did you get any answers from him? We tried, Heather, but Mr. Bronfman has not returned any of our calls or emails. We then asked the Prime Minister's office what they thought, and they referred us to the Liberal Party. And in a statement, the party told us that Stephen Bronfman sits on the National Board as a volunteer, supporting fundraising and not policy decisions. Jillian, thank you very much. Thank you. You can find more about the Paradise Papers investigation on our website. Still to come, other stories we're following tonight, including a swift crackdown on corruption in Saudi Arabia. Royalty, billionaires and government officials are caught in its sweep. That's straight ahead on The National. It was as if all of London was in love. 600,000 people filling the streets come to share a special day. as they cheered every carriage, and as they listened quietly to the ceremony on the speakers. I pronounce that they be man and wife together. They were, quite simply, rejoicing. Because I love these things. I love royal weddings and royal anything. Yes, it's Britain, isn't it? It's Britain. We're here because we're English, we're British. This is a great day for us. The crowd in front of me today has been uh, absolutely marvellous. They've enjoyed themselves watching the procession and uh, they seem to have enjoyed it thoroughly. It was a time to forget all the troubles and anyone who tried to bring them up didn't have a chance. It's good for the country. It's good for ordinary people like me who go to work every day. 
Yeah, but what about people that have got jobs? Millions of other people like us, all right? What about people that have got jobs? I enjoy it. What about fellas like me as well? What about fellas like me? It's just for the ordinary working people who go to work every day who've got a job. Right, we're lucky we've got a job. This is marvellous. This is England. Not only the British thought it was marvelous, the Trudeau children watched from Canada House with their mother. Um, well, I thought it was like a fairy tale. And like um, the, the trumpets and the band and, and the um, Prince Charles was the prince and Lady Diana was the princess and, and was very happy. What did you think of Lady Diana? I think she was very beautiful. And I'm glad that Prince Charles has picked her. He has made a very good choice. Misha, what did you think of the whole thing? I think the band was nice. I'm a musician myself, so I would think it's nice all the time. Lady Diana was nice. Charles was nice. The church was nice. The queen was nice. Not just the children, but all the world seems captivated by the beautiful princess in her magnificent dress. She looked beautiful. She had lovely frills around here. She looked like a lemon colour, didn't yeah. it? Lemony cream. It wasn't wine. Exactly. Even as they saw it, this London fashion house was copying it, frantically working from a sketch made the moment the bride appeared on television. Ours is white, hers with ivory, more to cream. Secondly, really the important thing is we are not using pure silk, we're using artificial silk and um, therefore it's a lot cheaper than Lady Diana's or Princess of Wales dress would be if one could buy it, which of course you can't. Within hours, three copies of the dress will be in London stores. Within days, thousands. The wedding has obviously been a tremendous boost for the British fashion industry and for the British economy. And also, perhaps above all, even if only fleetingly, for a faltering British spirit. Eve Savory, CBC News, London. Now to Montreal, a surprise result in that city's mayoral election. Valérie Plante will be the next mayor and the first woman elected to the position. Simon Nakoneshny is at Plante's celebration. Simon. Heather, a huge upset here in Montreal as Denis Coder is out after one term as Montreal mayor. He was defeated by 43-year-old Valérie Plante of the left-leaning Projet Montréal party. Plante becomes the first woman mayor to be elected in Montreal. The mother of two has a background in community organizing, but not a lot of political experience. After tonight, she'll be in charge of the second biggest city in Canada. Heather? Simon, Denis Coderre was supposed to be a shoe-in. What happened? The Coderre uh, campaign never really got off the ground, and Valérie Plante ran a sort of anti-Coderre uh, campaign, where Denis Coderre was seen to have been sort of uh, gruff and sometimes uh, mercurial. Valérie Plante smiled through the whole campaign, and it seems like tonight Montrealers opted for change over stability. Thank you very much. Simon Nakoneshny in Montreal tonight. A series of arrests in Saudi Arabia has stunned people inside that country and beyond. Eleven princes, along with several former and current government ministers, have been detained. Behind it all, 32-year-old Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who has launched an aggressive crackdown on corruption. As Derek Stoffel reports, there is a bigger strategy involved. This is clearly a move by both the Crown Prince and his father, King Salman, to solidify their grip on power. They now control all aspects of the Saudi security forces and the military, as the two princes that were in charge of the Navy and the National Guard were among those arrested. Now, the Saudi Crown Prince has also been pushing an agenda of economic and social reform in the kingdom. Saudi women will be allowed to drive next summer. There was even a comic convention and a pop concert earlier this year. Reforms that have made the Crown Prince popular among young Saudis. 
But at the same time, he has faced severe criticism from conservative clerics who oppose most of the reform agenda. These arrests show that Crown Prince Salman seems happy to shake things up in a country that simply isn't used to change. Derek Stoffel, CBC News, Tel Aviv. The deposed leader of Catalonia turned himself in to Belgian police today, along with four of his associates. But late this evening, a judge granted Carlos Puigdemont and the others a conditional release. Spain wants him on charges related to the secessionist campaign. <laughs> In the hours before his release, a crowd hit the streets of Madrid to show their support for Catalonia. It declared independence over a week ago. But Spain sacked the regional government and took control. A Belgian court will now have to decide whether to execute the arrest warrant issued by Madrid. When we come back, a sneak peek at one of the most anticipated makeovers in the history of CBC News. Today's events were part of a program which has been going on since Wednesday evening. Gays and non-gays mingled at the fair, some coming from as far away as Holland and California. Well, there are a few hundred thousand gay people in the city of Toronto, and we felt that uh, the organized gay community wanted to have a celebration of our culture, our community, and this is, this is it. This is Gay Days. They say together they can work toward acceptance by general society. Though they marched through the streets today as they have before, the tone was less serious. There were no nightsticks, no confrontations. In the park, the atmosphere was festival. Gay pride uh, is an expression we use to say that uh, we're proud of our sexuality, that we're, uh, we're not ashamed to say that uh, our lifestyle is worth living. More than a thousand of the city's estimated quarter of a million gays and lesbians celebrated with a sense of humor. They even found a way to laugh at AIDS. <laughs> this is supposed to be a public celebration. It's ironic that at this event, some entertainers and some participants in the rally asked us not to take their picture. Gays and lesbians marching here fear reprisals for their lifestyle. A sweltering summer Sunday in the city. A day to meet friends. Lots of friends, as it turned out. It may have been the biggest block party of the season. The parade, too, was a hit, an indication of the self-confidence and self-assurance that lesbians and gays have acquired here in only a few years. This year, participants had something else to celebrate, the legal right to marry. Hundreds of thousands lined the streets. San Diego native Richard Reed and his partner Ernie Lacasse have been to pride parades before. This is their first as a married couple. For them, and for their fellow June brides and grooms, this year's parade is indeed a happy one. They're, <clears throat> they're circular, and uh, the inside of the rim is scorched a little all around, and these circles are approximately 34 to 35 feet wide. It was a disc shape, and it had a dome in the middle. Oh, it was a beautiful ship. It was a creamy white color. It's as if a giant cookie cutter has stamped out circles. They range from 2 to 20 meters in diameter and come in a variety of patterns. Some swirl clockwise, others fan out from the center. Around the crisp perimeter, the fields are intact. The plants are going through some form of molecular change, causing them to grow into uh, huge dartboard patterns. It's beyond anything we can suggest, and beyond any conventional science, the way this has been constructed. Visitors are coming from miles around to see the latest attraction near Conquest, Saskatchewan. It's the most excitement people in this area have seen in a while. One of the circles looks like a donut. Another has a tail pointing to the south. And on a nearby field owned by a Hutterite colony, there are six circles. In all of them, the stalks of wheat are flattened but not damaged. I'm not a great believer in UFOs. <laughs> But uh, once you see them right up close, they're different. Before we go, a reminder, things will look a little different on the National starting tomorrow.
part of our major relaunch. Four new hosts, Ian, Adrian, Rosemary, and Andrew, will bring their unique skills to build on the Nationals' 50-plus year legacy, moving the program forward with new elements and new approaches to telling the stories that shape this country and the world, including a much stronger presence online. That is The National for this Sunday night. I'm Heather Hiscox. Thank you for watching.